one summer. We were up in Lubbock. Yeah, I'll put that up there where it's a little closer. One summer, my brother and I, Preston, we were up in Lubbock visiting grandparents. And, and my grandfather came to us one day and he said, Hey, would you boys like to earn some money? Well, we were teenage boys. So, of course, we wanted to earn some money. And I don't remember what he paid us, but it was more than we got working for nothing for Dad. And so we said, yeah, what do you need us to do? And he said, well, I've got a boxcar load of lumber that needs to be unloaded. It was loaded on the boxcar in such a way you couldn't get a forklift on there and just pull it off. You had to slide each board out one at a time and, and stack them up and bundle them up so that the forklift could pick them up. And so we said, yeah, we'd love to do that for you, Grandpa. We were probably... 14 and 12 or maybe 15 and 13 something like that neither one of us had our license so I know we were younger than 16 and so he took us over there early one morning while it was still cool it was the middle of the summer so it's probably in the 80s that morning and so we could get quite a bit of work done before the sun came up and it got really warm which once the sun came up the temperature would rise especially inside the box car and so he wanted us to get a good early morning start so he takes us over there and we get to working and we worked hard i mean we were hard working kids you know like a lot of young people are we we got after it. we you know got into the work and we were sliding the boards out and one of us would be up in there and we'd slide a board out and the other one would grab it and pull it down and stack them up until we had this much wide and this much tall and then we'd put a band around them. And so we're really getting after it until we heard a train coming by on a track a couple of tracks over. And so we had to stop because we didn't have trains there in Sonora where we grew up and so this was going to be pretty cool. And my brother said, I always wondered what would happen if you put a penny on the track. And so we have to run over there, and he's digging in his pockets, and he pulls out a penny. Well, then, what would happen if you put two pennies together on the track, and then three pennies? And, and so before long, we're just going around everywhere looking for stuff just to see what would happen if the train ran over a bottle top or a pull tab or a piece of broken glass or a rock or something. And so we're lining stuff up on these railroad tracks, the guy on the tra train blowing his horn, and we can see his face through the little window like that, you know, and he's blowing his horn. And finally, we got everything lined up on the track, and then we backed up, and we had to sit down, and we had to watch as the train ran over all of this stuff to see what would happen. Of course, it was a long train going very slowly, and so we sat there for quite a while, and and then finally when the train passed, we had to go and inspect all of our different little things. And we had to talk about them and show each other what, they, what had happened to them and, and everything. And we just chose some that we stuck in our pockets. Some we put back on the track to see what would happen if they went through a second train. And then we found some other things. So we had the track pretty well lined up again. And, and we were satisfied with that. So we went back to work, you know, because we're working really hard. We're getting paid for this work. One of us climbs up in the box car and is sliding lumber out again. And we hadn't been at it maybe 10 minutes, and this car pulls up. And this guy gets out, and he's actually like really mad. And he yells at who, whichever one was in the box car to get down. And I mean, he started just letting us have it. He worked for the railroad. And he explained to us that not only is it dangerous to put stuff on the railroad tracks, but it's also illegal to put stuff on the railroad tracks like that. And so he wasted a lot of our time lecturing us about this stuff. And then he made us go and he made us clean all of the stuff that we put off the tracks. And finally he lectures us some more. And then he wants grandpa's number and he wants mom's phone number and all of this kind of stuff. And so then he finally left and we could get back to work because we're working hard, you know. I mean, we're paid, getting paid to work. And, so we get after it again, and, and then we see the uh, food truck drive up to the factory down the road from us there, and we have some money in our pockets, and so we decided to run down and get some food at the food truck. So we run down there, we each bought a bottle of orange juice and a fried pie, and so we walked back and we sat down in the shade under the railroad car, it was the only shade there was, and we drank our bottle of juice and we ate our fried pie, and we talked about the train incident, and we visited about that for a while, and so finally after a while we get back to work, because, I mean, we're good, hard-working young men, 
And uh, so we're loading, sliding this stuff off. And I remember I was up in the box car and we had gotten to some real thick lumber and it was 16 feet long with anywhere between four and 12 inches, two inches thick, and it was real heavy. And so I got a piece sliding down. I'm up in the box car, the door is over here, and I'm sliding this piece around to the side to, for my brother to catch. And I look down and he's not there, which is kind of weird. And so I yelled at him. I said, Pee-wee. And he stood up just as that board caught him right in the back of the head, laid him out flat, blood kind of going everywhere. Well, then he gets up and he's mad at me. He thinks I did it on purpose. Now, what brother would beat your brother in the back of the head with a piece of lumber on purpose? And so I said, I'm yelling and screaming. I didn't do it. Well, he jumps in the boxcar. He's going to beat me. You know, and so I jumped out the other side and we're chasing each other around. And about that time, Papa, our grandpa, he shows up to take us to lunch because it's lunchtime now. Well, he pulls up and he is not very happy. First of all, he got a call from the railroad department and uh, we kind of, the guy told him, made up some stuff about us. But anyway, so he's number one upset with that. Number two, one of us is bleeding and trying to kill the other one. And number three, there's not a whole lot of lumber off of this box car, and it has to be empty by five that day. And we knew Papa was upset because when he took us to lunch, he didn't even buy us a Coke. We got a little paper cup full of water, and Papa always bought us a Coke, but he was, man, one of the first times I ever saw Papa really mad at us. And so he takes us back to the box car after, after we ate lunch, and he said, boys, this has to be empty by five o'clock. No problem, Papa. We're, we're hard workers. We'll get this done for you. Well, then he goes back to the lumber yard and he sends one of his other workers back to oversee our work. And I'll never forget Raymond coming back. Raymond wouldn't let us take a water break or a potty break unless Raymond needed a water break or a potty break. And Raymond was three-fourths camel. I swear this guy never drank. Never had to use the restroom. When he was up in the boxcar, he was sliding boards out two at a time. He never stopped. I don't think I've ever sweated as much in my entire life. But, 5 o'clock, Papa shows up to get us. The boxcar is empty and everybody's happy. Next summer, Papa says, would you boys like to earn some money? Of course, Papa would always like to earn some money. He said, now I want you to know, I'm paying you to work, not to play. And that was always the rule after that because Papa knew that we kind of had this tendency to get sidetracked and play a little bit. We had to kind of learn that lesson. Because, you know, one of the most annoying things for an employer is to have an employee that will not do their job. Always there's some excuse, there's always something that comes up and they just won't do their job. One of the most annoying things for an employee is to have a fellow employee that will not do their job. No matter what, <laughs> no matter what job they've got, it's like they, they will whine, they will complain, they'll find any way they can to get out of that job. But even what's even worse than any of those is when you've got someone who claims to be a Christian who won't do their job. Because for some interesting reason, and I think I know why this is, the world has this view that Christians are supposed to be hardworking people. Because I can't tell you how many times I've had people who aren't Christians when they find out that I'm a preacher and that I'm a Christian, they'll start telling me about these Christians they work with who won't do their job and how it just absolutely drives them crazy. And I know some of you have shared with me stories about people that you work with who don't do their job, they won't do their job, and yet they claim to be Christians. Because see, I think it's known understood by the world around us that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you're also supposed to be a good worker. 
I also heard people complain that, you know, yeah, I've got this boss and he's horrible or she's just mean or you can't trust them and they're not dependable and, and they want all this work but they don't do anything and yet they claim to be Christian. See, the world seems to have this understanding, sometimes better than the church, that if you claim to follow Christ, the way you conduct yourself at work is important and reflects a lot about who you claim to be. And this is what Paul deals with in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. And if you want to turn there with me, that's where we're going to be this morning. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, page 829. And we're going to begin with what Paul says about workers first. And so if you want to turn there, page 829 in the Pew Bibles, we're going to read verses 5 through 8 where Paul says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters. Now, I'm going to stop right there real quick because we're not going to get in this morning to slavery. There's always a lot of questions that come up when, when Paul talks about slavery. Is Paul saying slavery is okay? Why doesn't Paul condemn slavery and everything else? We're not going to take the time. I don't have the time this morning during this lesson to address those issues. If, if slavery and Paul's understanding of it is a big concern to you, come see me after church. We'll talk about it a little bit. But that's not what he's addressing this morning. He's not talking about whether slavery is good or bad. In Paul's time, slavery was kind of the norm. One of the commentaries I read in preparation to this said, you know, in, in Paul's day, slavery was kind of like electricity is in our day. I mean, it's just, that's the way it is. Everybody uses electricity. How many of you here in this room have no electricity in your home and never use electricity? See, we just use it. That's just the way things are. Well, in Paul's day, that's the way it was. Slavery was, was the common thing. And so, as Paul addresses those who work for others, he's addressing slaves. The norm in our world today is not slavery, even though some of you may feel that way at times. But the norm in our world today is employees working for employers. And so, and I think the lesson here is going to apply to there. But back to chapter five, 6, verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity in your heart just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their, when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. <clears throat> Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good He does, whether He is slave or free. <clears throat> Paul, this morning, there's four phrases in this that I want you to notice. And if you want to write these down, we're going to refer back to them in a little bit, but four key phrases that I want us to notice. The first one is in, is in verse 5 where he says, just as you would obey Christ. Just as you would obey Christ. The next one is in verse 6 where he says, like slaves of Christ like slaves of Christ. The third one is also in verse 6 where he says, doing the will of God from your heart. Doing the will of God from your heart. And then we have the last phrase in verse 7 where he says, serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. And then he goes on and says, and not men. And this is something we need to keep in mind because you and I no longer live like the rest of the world. You and I, once we become part of the body of Christ, we have been reborn. We are different. And if you turn over into chapter 2, verse 10 of Ephesians, Paul says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I think... We're created to do good works, and part of our good works is being good workers. It all goes back to chapter 5, verse 21, which we saw a couple of weeks ago, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I think one of the reasons people don't work like they should 
is a lot of times people get this attitude that, you know, well, this job is beneath me. I'm too good for this. Somebody else ought to do this. Now, I shouldn't be bossed around to have to do all of this menial stuff. I'm just above this all. And I want us to, to keep one thing, keep this in mind this morning. I want us to keep in mind that Jesus' job that he was sent to earth to do was beneath him. And, and I want you to understand, the creator of the universe, Jesus, comes down to walk on the earth to touch lepers, to face demons, to be overwhelmed with crowds of demanding people, demanding to be healed and cured all the time. He came down, his job was to be mistreated, to be beaten, to be rejected by his own people, and ultimately to be put onto a cross with common criminals. And he was king of kings and lord of lords. And what his past was on earth was way, way beneath him. Sometimes in our jobs we get this attitude of our boss is too demanding and he wants more of us than we can ever give and he demands things that he should never demand of us. Jesus' boss was a little over demanding. In fact, Jesus goes to him the night before he's betrayed, the night that he was betrayed and he said, I really don't want to do this. There's any other way for this cup to pass from me, let it happen. And his boss said, this is the job you were given. And Jesus humbled himself and he gave his life on the cross. Now, if we claim to be followers of that same Jesus, then there is no job beneath us. There is no task that our Master ever asks us to do that we shouldn't do. In fact, I think one of the common things that happens <clears throat> is we get this attitude, and I said, I'm going to address that here in a little bit. I'll get, I'll get to that. Go back and look at verse 8 again. Jesus, after he submitted himself, and after he did that job that was beneath him, we know that God lifted him up. And in verse 8 we read, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. God calls us as Christians, as people in the workplace, to do our jobs and to do them well without complaining, without arguing, without being lazy. We're to do our jobs, as he said earlier, just as you would obey Christ, as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart and serving the Lord. But what about bosses? Because, you know, I know we're speaking, everybody in this room either is employed, was employed, or will be employed. Okay, so we can all understand that. But there are also those who are employers, those who oversee others. And maybe in your job, you have a responsibility to oversee other people. Well, as a Christian, how are you to act? And that's what we see in verse 9, where he says, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism in him. Now, when, when I read this this week, I saw something that I really hadn't seen before, or last week when I was looking at it. When Paul says, and masters treat your slaves the same way. Now, I have always kind of taken that, that, that he wants masters to treat their workers as God treats people. But he says, I want you to treat them in the same way. Well, look back to what he just said about workers. And what he just said about workers is, just as you would obey Christ, like slaves of Christ, 
doing the will of God from your heart and serving the Lord. And maybe he's telling masters that's the way you need to be to your workers. Again, it goes back to chapter 5, verse 21, where he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I know it's our human nature to always seek a position of authority and power and to be able to lord it over those below us. And, and Paul knew that masters in his time would do the same thing. They want that position of authority. They want to be able to tell everybody else what to do. That's kind of human nature. In fact, Jesus dealt with this uh, during his own ministry. Flip back with me to Matthew chapter 20 on page 697. Matthew chapter 20, we're going to begin in verse 20. Matthew 20, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it that you want? he asked. And she said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other one at your left in your kingdom. In other words, give my sons a position of power and authority. You do not know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. See, they wanted the position of power and authority also. Verse 23, Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. And Jesus called them together and said, You know <clears throat> that the rulers, the Gentiles, lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give His life as a ransom for many. Now I think if we take that Matthew chapter 20 passage and we bring it over into Ephesians chapter 6 verse 9, we can understand that the Master is also the servant of those that work under Him. And I think that's what Paul is reminding them. Masters, you treat those who work under you just as you would obey Christ. Just as slaves of Christ yourselves, doing the will of God from your heart and serving the Lord. Because His purpose, the Master's purpose, the servant's purpose, everybody's purpose as Christ's servants is to serve one another. It doesn't matter what your position is. You are to serve one another. And that's what really should distinguish Christians in the workplace, whether they're workers or whether they're bosses, is whatever your role is in your place of employment, your task is to serve everybody around you. And we need to keep that in mind. Christians work hard without complaining. They serve those around them, both those that are above them and those that are below them because we are servants. We are submissive to one another out of reverence to Christ. But I know that is hard to do sometimes. It's hard to be submissive to our fellow employees when they don't do their job and when they are annoying and when they are frustrating, and when they're mean, and when they make fun of us because we're Christians, it's hard to be submissive to people like that. Amen? Amen. And it's hard to be submissive and serve a boss as if I'm serving the Lord when that boss is mean and nasty and he, he doesn't even know what he's doing, but he's giving me orders how to do it. Can any of you relate to that? I know you could. But we're supposed to be submissive to them. How do we do that? Those of you who are in positions of leadership at your job, whether they're foremans or whether you just hire other people to do things, 
you know, and you're responsible for teaching and leading others and, and organizing this group. It's hard to serve them when they won't work. And they've always got excuses. And, and it's just like beating. How do we do that? How do we be Christian in its truest sense in our workplace? I think this is one of the biggest struggles we have. And that is why God has given us His church. And this is so important, and I want you to understand, and I want you to get this because we all wrestle with these issues. How do I live as a Christian in an environment that is not Christian, dealing with people who aren't Christians, and yet I have to reflect Christ in a good way? Because I'll tell you this, we don't want to ever be the kind of people that somebody says, yeah, you know old Brandy over there? Yeah, she claims to be a Christian, but I've worked with Brandy before. By the way, I have worked with Brandy before. We never want to be that kind of person somebody talks about. Amen? We want to be the kind of people that somebody says, you know what? I, I, I work with uh, uh, I work with Liz. And you know what? Liz was the most awesome worker I've ever had. I don't know if it was because of her faith or not, but she's one of the hardest working people I ever worked with. That's what we want to reflect. But sometimes we don't know how to do that. And that's why God has given us the church. Because wherever you are in your workplace today, there is somebody here that's worked in a similar environment, under a similar boss, with similar employees, whatever your circumstance, and they have wrestled with this same stuff. And God brings us together so we can talk to others and gain wisdom as to how do we live this out in our workplace. You know, that's one of, the, one of the reasons God gives us elders. Elders who have navigated that minefield or are still navigating that minefield. Not to say that our elders are perfect and they've got every answer, but they've lived it and they've wrestled with it for enough years that they've gained some insight and wisdom that they might be able to help you. Or there's others here in the congregation who have worked and lived and served for years and years and have wrestled with this and have been begun to put some pieces together and they've got some wisdom as to how to do it. Now I want to encourage you people, if you are still in a, in a work position and you're dealing with this kind of stuff, use the church. At the end of each, of each service, we invite you to come down and, and share with us struggles that you're having so we can pray with you, talk about things with you and help you in any way that we can. Use that. Use our elders. Call them up. Go see them after services and say, you know what, I'm really having this struggle at work and it's getting to the point where I'm having trouble being a Christian at my place of employment. I don't know what to do. Can I visit with you about it a little bit? Call somebody else here in the church that's worked for a long time that you have a lot of respect for and say, hey, would you mind coming over to the house and eating supper with me? And, you know, sit down with me and my family this week because I've got, I, I just like to pick your brains about some things. I think that's what the early church did. I think they wrote to Paul and they said, we're having these issues. Would you share with us some advice? And that's what Paul wrote back. You see, church, if we're going to have that mountain peak experience in life that, that we've been called to in Ephesians, we have to live it in every aspect of our life all the time. But it's not always easy. So this morning, I want you to think about places in your life where you could use some assistance. And I want you to look around the room here today and I want you to recognize some people that you think might be able to offer you some wisdom in those areas. Because it is so important that we reflect Jesus in every aspect of our life. If you need help this morning in any way that we as a congregation can help you with, Chuck is going to make his way back up here. No? Jim is going to come up here because he can get here faster than Chuck can. 
So Jim is going to make his way up here, and he's going to lead us in this song. We're all going to stand, but if there's anything we can help you with so that you can be the kind of worker, the kind of boss, the kind of Christian that you need to be, please come let us know while we stand and sing this song. <laughs>